everybody. Welcome to Agribition. We are very excited to be here with Levi Jackson with Jackson Cattle Company. And he's going to talk to us about his cattle operation. So I'll let you take it away, Levi. Well, thank you. Uh, so my name's Levi. Uh, we run a purebred and commercial uh, beef cattle. And we're fortunate that we're just 30 miles southeast of Regina here. So it's real easy for me to be a part of Agribition. I'm, uh, I'm on the board of directors, uh, but uh, I've been a volunteer at Agribition for 36 or 37 years now. And uh, it's just a tremendous place to be. But first and foremost, I'm a livestock producer and we make our living out of our cattle. And that's, we don't have any other ways that we make our living or, or, or get by financially. So we have to do a very good job in looking after our livestock in order to, to make that work. So that's what my wife and my son uh, and I do. And it's a great way to live. It's a tough way to make a living, but it's a great way to live. So that's what I've got. So I'm gonna encourage everybody, um, all of the classrooms to put their questions in the chat. So um, if anybody has any questions for Levi, please just type them in the chat and I'll make sure that they all get answered. Um, but in the meantime, Levi, do you want to talk about your herd? Um, what type of cattle do you raise? So we raise our, the base of our commercial cattle are our Angus cattle and predominantly black ones. Uh, my son raises some purebred black Angus as well. Um, and we use a, a variety of bulls. Uh, by that I mean uh, we use Simital bulls as well as Angus bulls on our commercial cows. And uh, that cross makes a, a really good cross. It makes our calves uh, grow very well and very acceptable in the, in the market. And uh, we, it, it's a 365 day a year job. We, we don't get a lot of time off. We do take some when we, when we can. And, uh, but when you have livestock, it's, it's pretty much every day year round. Whether they're out on pasture, or whether we're feeding them all winter long. And by feeding them all winter long, I mean when it's 35 below and the wind's blowing and it's nasty, and some of you kids are maybe being able to sit inside and watch TV, play a video game or something, we're outside looking after our livestock uh, because they rely on us for everything and we do everything we can to make sure they have everything that they require to survive and, and thrive and, and grow really well. So that's what we do. Um, do you have here today? Uh, how many cattle do we have? My son has three purebred Angus in the in the barns. I don't have any myself. As I've said, my son Chance is developing his own purebred herd of Angus cattle. I'm on the Agribition board, so I spend a lot of... Uh, I, look, I kind of oversee all of the beef shows, so I keep very, very busy in every day at Agribition going around and, and just making sure everything's running right on that side of things and uh, doing the best that I can to make this show the great show that it is. Okay, thank you. So just a reminder, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll definitely get them addressed. Um, Levi, what are your cattle doing at home right now? Where are they? Are they still in the pasture or? <clears throat> They're, actually, we do have what we call stockpiled grass where we do keep a couple of quarter sections of grass for late in the season. But right now with it being as cold as it is, we would have to be chopping ice at some dugouts in order to have them have drinking water. So instead of them doing that, uh, some of my son's cattle are over at his place and they're, they're out what we call swath grazing. So it was a blend of a multi-species grasses and, and other uh, other products that we grew, then we cut it down with a swather and it just lays, and then we turn our cows out into it, and we use, uh, we, we do it uh, bit by bit. They don't get a whole field. We just use an electric wire that goes across and they get to eat uh, the swath uh, during that time, and, and the cows at our place are bale grazing. And so we put out a number of bales and uh, we take the twine off some, leave the twine on some, and my cows are out uh, bale grazing. They all have access to coming up to the yard to good quality water, 
and good shelter in that as well. But that's what we do to keep them. We don't have to have them in the yard all the time, each and every day through the winter. It's actually better for them if they're out moving, exercising, uh, they just stay so much fresher and healthier. And uh, so we'll do that as long as we can until some of them start to calve. My son calves his purebred cows from the middle of February on. We have a bull sale at our place in early February. So once we're done with our bull sale, then uh, we start bringing the, well, the cows that are gonna calve have come up already into the yard for a while to get conditioned to, for calving season. But our commercial cows that calve in April, we'll keep them out as much as we can. And as I've said, it's healthier for them. They stay clean. They're well exercised and lots of movement and they, uh, they do very, very well on that. And we try and breed that kind of cow that thrives in those kind of conditions. Okay. So what are some of the adaptations that cows or cattle have to stay warm? What do cattle need or have to stay warm? Yeah. One of the things that we try and breed for is good haired cattle. Uh, if, you, if you end up with a lot, with your cows that are kind of slick haired, uh, would be like a, somebody with lots of hair or somebody that's either cut it all off or is kind of bald themselves, it's, you're gonna cool off a little quicker. So a good hair coat is, is very, very necessary and we breed for that. But the main thing is to have a good quality food source, that keeps their, their energy, that gets everything internal that, that keeps them warm. And it's amazing how well livestock, our beef cattle, can do in cold climates. They do exceptionally well. We can have calves that are born when it's 20 below inside, but within a couple of days, they're all dried off, they've nursed, they're very healthy, they've had a couple of really good days uh, nursing their mother, they can go out into 20 below. They, can go, they go out into trails that have some sheds on them and we have an area within those sheds that they can get into themselves and they do wonderfully well. It's, it's amazing to watch how resilient they are. Okay, great. <coughs> um, oh, sorry, I just lost the chat here. Okay, um, can you tell me about your pasture management and how you manage the soil to make sure that the cattle are eating good, uh, good quality stuff? question is uh, about our pasture, our, our grass, how we manage it and manage the soil. Boy, I could talk for a long time. My wife should be here to talk to you about that. She is exceptional at, at that very thing and she has researched. Y you never quit learning. There's always something you can learn. Just because you've done something the same way for 20 or 30 years doesn't mean you can't change and adapt. So in our grazing, we started doing some more intensive grazing and we use electric wire and that doesn't, when I say electric fence or electric wire, if they touch it, they get a little shock so they learn not to bother it. And we will put a larger group of cattle into a smaller area, have them eat that all down, not all down actually, for soil health and soil management, we will, uh, they'll go in and eat, and eat a certain percentage of it they'll leave a certain percentage of it, and then we move them to another grazing cell. And we don't come back to that. That piece right there that they, that they ate, they don't see that again until next year. And that way, there is lots of regrowth. It's better for the soil. That regrowth, that new plant that's come back again, takes carbon out of the air, uh, becomes nitrogen into the soil, far better soil management. And on our larger pieces of grass, a quarter or half sections, we started splitting them up somewhat, not into small pieces, but maybe into 40 acre pieces where they'll go in and, and graze that, that 40 acres, the next 40, the next 40, and the next 40. And again, we try not to go back to those pieces that have been grazed. It's better for the plants, it then becomes better for the soil. And uh, it's a, it takes more time, it takes a little more uh, cost, but it, it, it really does work and it helps dramatically. So grass, gra grass is everything to us. 
And, and you know what, lots of you may not realize, the weather dictates everything that works or doesn't work for a farmer or a rancher. We can do absolutely everything right. And if the weather doesn't work with us, we can be really, really wrong and, and have a bad year. Last year was a terrible year for Western, Western Canada. This year there were parts of it were fantastic. And we were fortunate, we had a great year. And I know there are still parts of Saskatchewan, when you go farther west, still had a tough year. And so like I said, weather means everything to us. So how do you manage when you don't get rain? So we had rain this year, but the past couple years we didn't have much rain. So how do we manage when the weather doesn't work for us if we don't get rain? That comes into that grass management from the previous question. Uh, you can't exactly drought proof yourself, but if you can manage your grass that when you're done your grazing season that not every piece of grass that you have has been eaten right down to where there's very little left. If you manage your grass in a way that there are new plants growing that uh, whatever moisture, whatever good conditions you might get early in the year might carry that on later into a bad year. So again, that style of farming or that style of managing your grass can help you in dry years. Can't necessarily save you, but it can help. And it does become challenging. It really, really does. The biggest thing sometimes too is uh, don't have more cattle than you have grass for. You, you, you have to have the right numbers and and like it or not, it, it can be pretty tough on us sometimes. We have a question from Ms. Kunipaga's uh, class. What feed helps your animal grow and build muscle? What feed helps grow, grow uh, our animals and build muscle? Yeah. So <coughs> we are, when it comes to building muscle, we're not, we're not a feedlot. We don't keep our, our cattle right to finish weight. We generally sell our, our calves when they're weaned off the cows. And uh, so, but in order to keep our cows healthy, we have good quality hay. If you have alfalfa hay, that's really nice. Uh, there's more energy and more protein in, in alfalfa than just a grass hay. But if you have good quality grass hay, it works as well. We also do, we also seed some oats and barley that we take off either as silage in a, in a still in a bale form, so we call it uh, bale, bale silage, silage bales, or we let it dry down a little more and we call it green feed, where there is grain that is in the heads of, of those, uh, of the oats and barley, but there's still lots of green stalk and stem that they have as well. So we try to feed test, do a test in all of our feed source to know what we are actually feeding our cattle. Because it is important to know if they're getting enough protein, enough energy. We do not supplement our cows with uh, pellets or grain. Our cattle, our cows uh, live on roughage. Hay, green feed, silage, whatever. We do, not, we do not introduce extra pellets or grain. We did, however, last year because we didn't have enough quality feed source, so uh, you have to adapt. When it comes to finishing and building muscle, uh, once they get into feedlots, there'll be either corn or barley would be the main sources uh, to get them up to that to those weights to uh, put muscle on them. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I had a question. And now it's There's the one that should be telling you all about the regenerative farming. She oh, just awesome. went by. <laughs> awesome. Um, so when you're talking about testing your feed, yes. your silage, where do you take it to get tested? Or do you test it yourself? No, we, um, we can take samples and send it. But there are, there are places, there's labs that it will go to. And it'll tell you the calcium levels, the phosphorus, the total digestive nutrients. It'll tell you the protein that, that that sample has, the energy composition. It, it can tell you all of those things. And if you're lacking in something, then uh, you can either get 
uh, it's like a tub, a round tub that it's kind of like a molasses base that the cattle like, but it has all the necessary nutrients into that into that tub that uh, can, can raise some of those things you might be lacking to make sure that your cattle do have everything they require and they need for the winter, as well as the summer. If, as last year, it was really bad, really dry. So we did have some of those blocks, some of those tubs out there that they could uh, they could eat uh, as they they lick it more than they eat it. Let's say because of the the base, the molasses base. Um, we also have uh, we also use a product. Uh, it, it's a liquid that they can lick off of a wheel. And uh, more kids, <laughs> right on. So uh, it's. We, we try and match everything that we have to then find other sources or resources to get everything that our livestock need. It's not, it's not just hit and miss. We don't, we don't hope that it's all right. We try and do everything we can to make sure that it is right. Okay, so who else helps you out on the farm? Like I, I, I'm thinking probably a feed specialist would help, but what other types of, of people or careers would help out on a cattle operation? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a family-run thing. My wife, Carmen, that just ducked by there, and uh, our son, Chance, and, and his wife, Emily. Our daughter was with us for a while, and she's teaching school now, so she's, she's not uh, part of the program that way. But uh, we... We, we utilize some other people. Most of what we do, we do ourselves. But when it comes to uh, investing in things like uh, uh, knowing what your feed source is, knowing uh, the evaluation of it, then yes, we'll, we'll use people that can tell us those things. And the younger cattle that we have, our replacement heifers, our first calf heifers, things like that, we do feed them pellets as well as the bull calves and the coming two-year-old bulls that we'll be selling, they are fed a, a pellet. And, and a pellet is, is a, a substitute for just a grain, whether it's oats or barley or whatever. And the pellet is made by the, the different companies uh, like Master Feeds here in town. And it will, cons it will be a guaranteed protein level of 14%. And uh, they have different evaluations of pellets. So we'll try and get one that will work for what we're trying to do with our young cattle by just growing them up easy or with our sale bulls, our two-year-olds that are already coming two years old, uh, a little bit, uh, a feed that's got a little bit more to it in terms of putting on more pounds. And, and then we try and feed them responsibly. Uh, so part of that is when it comes to money, the money side of it, we do a feed test on our, on our silage bales, on our barley silage bales. That feed test tells us what's there. So then we get a pellet that will match what we require to grow our heifer calves. And then we also can take that information and decide if we can get by with feeding them three pounds of that pellet a day or if they need five pounds of pellet. So we, we do that we do as much information as we can to mostly, well, to obviously make it the best we can for our livestock, but to keep it cost effective as well. Great, okay. So any questions out there, please put them in the chat. Um, how often does the vet come out to your farm? As little as possible. <laughs> but we, we, are, we are very, very fortunate. We have, uh, we have three different vet services that we use, and we use them all for a little bit different things. And uh, the, uh, we, we have learned how to manage and, and, and look after the health of our cattle a, a great deal on our own. But the other thing that we do is we do contact our vets uh, quite often to, to ask their opinions on some things that we're not quite sure of because they're experts in what they do. I mean, that's their field. And if we, if we have an issue that we aren't 100% comfortable, then we, we ask their opinion. We obviously do. And uh, we don't necessarily need to have them come out very often. 
unless it's something specific, uh, a calving issue or you have something that definitely has a, a health problem that we can't uh, get by on our own. So uh, we use them. We use them when we have to, but we call them. We call them when we need to. Absolutely, that's all part of the process. Yep. So Levi, is there anything that you want to say before we wrap up our session? Um... Well, I guess. <sighs> What I, I guess what I'd like to say is that I, I'm not sure what all you young folks hear on, on whatever information you get. Uh, and sometimes it's not very flattering to livestock producers. And the, the truth is, we look after our livestock exceptionally well. This is what we've chose to make our living out of, and we like our cattle. We look after them exceptionally well. If we don't do that, then they don't do what, the, what we need them to be able to do for us. And we're, they are so humanely treated. In the background here, you, you can see all these cattle that are in the stalls being blown and combed and brushed and handled so well. Those cattle get led around through this entire facility by just a rope that's on their head. That's how well they've been treated by the people that have raised them and brought them to town to, to come here and compete. And uh, it's, if, if they weren't looked after that well, you wouldn't be able to do things like that with them. So we, uh, we really do like what we do. We do a good job of it. And I can't tell you that each and every person is all 100% great. You know that there's going to be exceptions once in a while. But by golly, I'll tell you, 98% of the people that I know are exceptional at looking after their livestock. They're, they're just, that's what we do. If we didn't like it, we wouldn't do it. So I, I hope, I just hope that you know that there are, I just hope that you know that there are uh, most of us out there that really do a good job. We, we do. Okay, well thank you so much Levi. Thank you for taking the time today. Thank you for our class that attended. We really appreciate that. My apologies for the technical difficulties at the start there, but thanks for joining in and thanks for learning all about cattle production. So with that, we'll wrap up the session, but um, if you have any questions, please let us know. And I hope you can attend some of our other sessions.